Hi everyone. We have some attendees just joining us now. So I want to welcome Jay and Lawrence and Manoj and Margaret and Ola and Ruan and Stephanie and Taryn and Sharon and William and Tom. We have many prospective students just joining us um, as well. I want to welcome each and every one of you, whether you are joining us from Australia, from New Zealand, from Canada, from Samoa, from the United States. We are so glad to have you here. Um, I'm Associate Professor Nicolette McGuire, and I'm joining you today from Nova Scotia, Canada. And so I'm pleased also to have our student ambassadors uh, here with us as well. So we have Jason Quick and Phoebe Muthril. We have Elizabeth Mills. Uh, I think we also have uh, Wila Laifa Lima. And I think that's all for our student ambassadors. So last but not least, I want to provide a very, very warm welcome to our guest of honor this evening, Dr. Paris Pierce. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Pierce. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So the way that this session will work is uh, I will be um, providing some information um, for Dr. Pierce to answer your burning questions. If you have some additional questions, that you'd like Dr. Pierce to answer, please go ahead and type them in the question and answer box and we'd be happy to get to them throughout the session. If you have questions about general admissions, I hope you'll join us for the upcoming admissions info session in August. But if you'd like to know a little bit of information from our current students who are here as our student ambassadors or from Dr. Pierce, I invite you to uh, ask those in the Q&A uh, box. So, Dr. Pierce, I'm going to start with, with you. I know that you have um, three roles at the moment. You're a very busy doctor. So would you tell us what, what are those roles and uh, what's a typical day like for you? No worries, yes. Um, I don't do things in half. So, yeah, I've got a few, few hats at the moment. Um, I'm working with uh, the Royal Flying Doctors. Um, and it's uh, a, a retrieval physician role. And that's based in a place called uh, Mount Isa. So that's, if you look at a map of Australia, it's pretty close to the centre of Australia up north. Um, so it's a pretty incredible role. I'm very honoured to work with the, um, the organisation. Haven't been asked to be on the TV yet, but Jason knows that, uh, that I've certainly got a face for it. So we'll see if I get the Guernsey. Um, my other role is in general practice uh, in a place called Ocean Shores in New South Wales, so a different state. Um, and they are also now, actually where I'm calling from today, uh, part of the Vein Doctors Group. So I do some, uh, some, some phlebology. Also now looking at um, the, doing some vasectomies, reversals, um, and a bit of lipoedema surgery, which is um, all in the context of managing uh, swollen legs. So yeah, I've got a bit on, so, but it, it's good. So how did you come across those positions? How did you end up doing what you're doing now? Yeah, look, I'm I'm now what almost seven years out from from uh, completing um, my degree, so I've kind of mixed around and travelled around a bit. Um, I'm studying to be a rural generalist, uh, so hence why I've got a few little hats. Uh, I did start my training off in emergency medicine, and then diverged to a bit of anaesthetics, and then uh, put my hat into some intensive care, and then I finally found my niche in uh, a bit of everything. So um, yeah, it's good, it's good. I've um, hopefully found my place and I can kind of settle down a bit. I think so. I, I know just even from when you were a student, you had many interests and, and took a lot of time and effort in all of the studies across um, all the different clinical areas. So I'm glad actually that you had a chance to um, bring that forward as you've been in your clinical practice. So glad to hear that. Um, I want to know a little bit like your about your background because you didn't start, you know, at, as someone who went to university into a pre-medical program straight out of high school and then right into medical school. So tell me a little bit about um, your background. What were you doing before you came to OUM? Yeah, so you can tell by the gray gray hairs in my beard that I'm not not too young. Um, I'm not as old as Jason, but um, uh, so it's uh. Yeah, so I started my journey as a personal trainer, which is probably why I can tell that I'm you know, quite fit looking. 
Um, and then I progressed into my career into paramedics. So I studied my undergraduate in health science. Um, we did seven years as an advanced life support paramedic. The last two years was in uh, uh, air ambulance. And that's when I kind of got the bug, uh, thinking that I'd like to, uh, to explore uh, medicine and see what it has to offer. Um, and I've, I've kind of moved around a little bit, which is to the demise of my wife. Um, she hates it. She's done. Uh, but yeah, so the journey's been good. But paramedics first and then, uh, then the intermedicine. So tell us a little bit more about that bug that you're describing. What made you want to make the, the change? Why did you want to pursue medicine after having a career as a paramedic? Yeah, I think, uh, as you can see by my journey thus far in the last seven years, it's been quite interesting and diverse and different states and uh, different jobs that I wouldn't even think about doing. I would have never thought about I'll be doing a vasectomy, um, you know, even, even two years ago. So medicine offers uh, change, change in landscape, ability to move interstate in Australia, overseas. Um, certainly a really robust, interesting program that OEM offers. I think it facilitates a, a quite a diverse, competent doctor. So I think, uh, yeah, just more diverse in my role to, to improve my um, ability to provide care to different people in different situations. So when you made this um, decision to move um, from paramedics into medicine, what, what kind of program were you looking for and what, um, what went into your decision? Yeah, so I was in air ambulance and I actually flew to a country town and I saw actually a, a current OUM student uh, at the time I was sitting in my GAMSAT and working towards getting into an Australian uh, medical school. Um, and I actually got an interview for, in South Australia and then she kind of presented this, this curriculum with, you know, interesting, interesting people, you know, robust program. Um, and so I did a compare and contrast, sat to my wife and explained to her that I want to go back to medical school. Once she got over that, then I said, what do you reckon? Should we go to South Australia or should we do an adventure? And we chose the, uh, the adventure. So I think what you're referring to, I mean, you, you, the program you went through is slightly different than the one um, we have now, but it's the same setup where there's a hybrid of online as well as in-person clinicals. So the first years of the program are all live interactive online courses, and then the clinicals are all um, on-site, obviously. So tell us a little bit about why you ultimately chose OUM. It's um, again a little bit older. Um, you know, life doesn't stop, response doesn't stop. So the was the the first half, the preclinical phase, being able to uh, complete work uh, whilst studying. Great, great in theory, but I'm sure you're looking. You talk to your ambassadors uh, all about working whilst studying. It's certainly a, a strong feat. Um, so especially we we're a bit older, we have families and and other dependents. So. Um, something's not to be underestimated. So it was more the versatility program, but uh, but also just being able to, I, mean, I was lucky enough to go to Samoa um, and, and do some, some time over there. And, you know, I certainly uh, uh, explored different health systems. So I think I don't like boring life. Um, I think OUM offered a, a, ro a robust program that was recognized. You know, it was getting results. I saw people who were actually practicing um, not only just in this country, in Australia, but um, so it was a combination of those things. So um, it was actually really no, a no-brainer. I want to ask you a little bit about um, clinical rotations and, and about um, doing clinical rotations in Samoa, but I want to ask you something first, which is I think there will be um, attendees tonight that um, are also in maybe have families, maybe have long-term relationships or in, or, or in partnered situations. So how, how does someone go about having this talk with their significant other or with their family about um, starting medical school and having that conversation successfully? Since you, you have already gone through that process, can you give them any advice? I think 100% open and honesty. I think if you uh, downplay or uh, point at you know rose colored glasses I think you're going to find yourself in a, in a in a heated dispute when you're trying to study for an exam or prepare for something I think it's um, look I think the how I am progress in terms of I was just speaking to Jason yesterday about um, the clinical program in terms of how much support uh, OEM is offering now with 
you know, people on the ground. Uh, that's certainly changed since since when I was with AUM. It was pretty much we used our existing contacts and made our own contacts um, to get placements. So um, it was just having that open discussion about this is what I want to do. This is this is how we're going to do it. You have to be flexible. Um, and I mean, I was fortunate. I didn't have a not fortunate, but um, I didn't have a child then. So that that that's certainly I think a complicating factor. And, uh, and, my, and luckily, I was lucky enough to my wife to come with the journey with me. So I certainly think if you can be a, uh, hey, let's do this together, we can, uh, you know, explore you know, Australia or, or, or the world even um, together. But I think it, just being open and being critical is, is the main thing. Almost look at a, at, a, at a negative slant and then if it works out better, awesome. But if it, if it goes that negative, at least you've had that discussion now before you got to study for an exam because they always pick a time. You know, you, you know, they have a pick a time. I think that's very good advice because you you are and were an incredibly hardworking student and now you're an incredibly hardworking doctor. And I think it's important for students and their partners to understand the amount of time that that takes. So being open and honest at the outset is, is really important. And I just want to touch upon, you were talking a little bit about the new supports that OUM has that are additions since you went through the program, but things like our academic advising program, we now have 24-7 academic advising support, and we have research advisors that support students to complete their research project, which is a requirement of the degree, but is you do not have to have a research background in order to complete the medical degree, or you don't have to have a research background prior to coming to OUM. That's why we have our research advising program, as well as our clinical mentors. So I know some of that was around um, when you were going through the program, but I think important to note. And if um, prospective students, if you have questions about that, we do have our student advisors um, here. So feel free to put some questions in the Q&A section and we'll be happy to get to those questions a bit um, later on in the session. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the preclinical program and the rigors therein. So what would you kind of advise people in terms of what what might be expected of them in terms of the amount of time or the amount of critical thinking or the level of study um, and commitment that they might need to get through the preclinical years, which are the first two years of the program? Yeah, look, um, they're tough. Uh, I mean, I come from a paramedic background, so you have some areas of strength. So, you know, if you've got some nursing staff, you know, and um, other allied health, that certainly helps. So it's a matter of uh, treat it as like a full-time job. I think 40 hours is a minimum, to be honest. Um, and it's going to be organised. Um, and the curriculum is robust. So it's not a, you know, you, you, you don't need look, it, I see, I mentor a lot of local graduates and um, a local uh, medical students through to my various roles. Um, I, sometimes I think, gee, they have it easy. Um, so I think, so I think, think certainly um, OUMs have got a very robust, it's, 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 it's a tough, um, tough curriculum, but I think it's doable. Um, it's nice, there's no fluff either, it's just it's all medicine stuff, yeah. Um, so that's the great thing about the, uh, the, uh, the postgraduate stream. So I think it's organised, um, like, you know, cardiology was, a, was a, a nice subject for me, but immunology was tough. So I think you just take those rest times that you, you maybe might not, you know, you know, like 30 hours one week because it's a, a multi that you're comfortable with. Use that time to rest and recharge, go for a run, do some fun stuff, and then know that the next week you might have to do 60 hours. So I, I'm hearing you talk a little bit about you and Jason chatting together, and I know that you knew each other before the program and maybe a bit through the program as well. And I want to touch upon that because, you know, particularly in the preclinical years where students are going through the live online courses, you may think, well, I'm just sitting by myself at my computer. I'm not going to know any of the other students. But what is the, what is the culture and camaraderie kind of like among students and cohorts? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think isolation is a big thing, hey? Um, you haven't got to compare yourself to peers. You can't grade yourself. Um, so that's where uh, the uh, student association came into play. And certainly 
myself and a few other colleagues put a lot of hard work into to establishing that. Um, and so it's reaching about the peers, colleagues, but also your, your academic advisors and, and mentors. Um, and the mentor is very important. So don't, it's your only requirement to have a mentor to tick a box, but they're, like, I still speak to my, my mentor now. Um, so I think treat the mentor seriously. It's, it's, yes, you do have to have one. So, but think about, you know, it, it's, it's, they really, you lean on them uh, when, when you need them to, to bounce off stuff. And with the Zoom now, I think it's, um, you, you can have a group study session quite effectively. So I think it's one positive out of COVID if you can drag that over. So just talking about requirements, let's talk about the requirement for a rotation in Samoa. So the way that the school is set up um, at the moment is that students do their core rotations in their local regions and all students have a requirement to do an elective in Samoa. The requirements were a little bit different when you went th through the program, but the rotations in Samoa have not changed all that much. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience doing a clinical rotation in Samoa? Don't get out of it. I don't know, like, I mean, there's always avenues. You can blame COVID, you can blame, you know, supply chains, whatever key phrase, but uh, it, it, yeah, just plan it in, plan your going, bring your partner, bring your family. Uh, it's an amazing hospital, uh, amazing culture. Uh, the Samoans are beautiful people. Um, it's paradise and uh, it's it's good medicine. It's it's complex. They're complex islanders. So I think, um, yeah, I, I was there for three months and uh, yeah, so I did um, a bit of general medicine, uh, surgery. Um, I, I didn't do any community medicine, so I kind of wish I did that, but um, yeah. So what would you say are the kind of main differences in doing a rotation in Samoa versus doing a rotation in Australia? Well, it's a cultural difference, isn't it? Um, I think it's important to acknowledge you know, the, the origin of our, uh, of our, of our university. Um, it, it, it sets uh, streets ahead of a lot of other, um, left for a better word, comparable um, ways to study medicine. Um, and I think it's important to, for, for us as doctors to be, I mean, Australia, you know, a lot of countries now are multinational, yeah, so lots of different cultures. Um, so I think it's important to just to experience different cultures and different delivery of medicine. The fundamental books, the textbooks are the same, language is similar, um, but I think the way to, to approach medicine is slightly different in terms of, you know, we have availability of all the bits involved in terms of investigations in Australia. So I think just bringing it back a bit to more clinical medicine is, uh, is really important. I like what you said about, you know, thinking about that being our origin. And OUM has this incredible diversity in terms of student ages and birth countries and first languages spoken and locations now, and yet we can all be in classrooms together learning from each other. And it really has a way of kind of enriching the experience. So I don't think it's just the Samoa rotation that allows for an enrichment of the experience, but having that um, exposure to, you know, different ways of learning different cultures if you, as you're in the same classroom, I think is, um, you know, something that's unique about the style of learning that we have at OUM. So I'm happy to, to hear that and also to, you know, acknowledge that Samoa is our home base and we're so, so lucky to have this beautiful um, country, these wonderful welcoming people, and the incredible opportunity to have rotations at Tupua Tuma Sese. So I'm glad that you had the experience to go there and yours was not interrupted um, from, from COVID. And, uh, and we've now, um, as of September, um, we're now restarting rotations, um, clinical rotations in Samoa, so that's really good too. Sorry, what would you, what were you going to say? Please go ahead. Yeah, so I just, go you just Google it. And then you push the zoom button yeah. and you just realize how isolated this little country is in the middle of an enormous sea. So I don't know, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, humbling to, to be able to deliver medicine in such a remote place. So tell me a little bit about what your favorite rotation was. What was it like and who did you learn from? It's pretty hard to make a favorite. Um, I think every, every rotation I had was, was incredible. 
Um, I was fortunate enough to spend three months in Nepal, in uh, Bratnagar, which is in the, right on the border near the India, um, when I was doing a, uh, um, a endoscopy and the power turned off and this poor chap was on the end of the scope and we had no power and no suction, no life. And that was kind of what you had to deal with. So that was incredible. Um, and just the delivery of care without any modern um, investigation because it couldn't be afforded. And then India, you know, over a thousand bed hospital, you know, uh, having, you know, like 40 theatres or something crazy. So it's, yeah, I, I can't, I, I can pluck so many positives out of so many rotations. You know, I was over in the West in Australia, in Geraldton, on the windy coast there and doing, um, you know, surgery. It was, it was incredible. And then back to Melbourne doing some, um, some primary health care and an alternative setting. So yeah, no, I, I can, I can rave on about all my rotations to be honest. So when you get to the end of clinical rotations, then you have a few, you know, steps to jump through, hoops to jump through. So you still have things like the FCE and OSCE. So what was that like? Was that some, was that a huge barrier to get through? Did you feel prepared at the end of your clinical rotations? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, if you're embarking in medicine, get used to exams. Um, then they won't stop even when you finish. Um, yeah, tough exam, hey, the FCE. It's a good, good exam. It's, um, you put the hard work in, you get through it, and then you'll be prepared for the AMC, which I think is a lot later question, so I won't harp on that. Um, and the OSCE was just great. We, it was eight of us, met up two days beforehand. Um, Dr. Mishak, uh, he's now kind of uh, retired from OUM now, but he was an incredible human being. And we got to practice face to face with these people that I've been seeing on the computer for so many years. Um, they were fair exams, tough exams. Again, great preparation for AMC part two, if that's the way you go. Um, it was just enjoyable. Uh, exams are always stressful, but they were fair, um, but they were tough, which is important, I think. So I'll just clarify that um, FCE is the final clinical examination, and that's a multiple choice exam. So it's structured similar to AMC1. And then the OSCE is the objective structured clinical examination, and that's an in-person exam where you have to show off all of your clinical skills with mock patients and uh, clinical examiners, and that's very much like the AMC2. So, so I am going to jump and ask you a little bit about AMC1 and 2. So tell me a little bit about your um, study strategy for AMC1 uh, first, and then we'll get into AMC2. Right. Also, I used my son was uh, only six months old, so he was my newborn assessment. So it was really quite good to use him. He just lied there for hours. It was great. Anyway, we fed him and stuff. Like that. All right. So um, AMC Part One. So your multi guess, multi choice test. Uh, it's it's a tough exam. It's it's a it's a beast in itself. Um, I, I suggest keep your study material that you did for FCE because you can just revise that um, and then modify a bit. I, I did use a. Uh, a local organization as a tutor just to it's about learning examiner certainly for IUM it's important to, to, to learn your professor to, to they like their niche things and no doubt that they'll be on the exam so the same for AMC it's all about learning learning examiner um, so, so I would re always recommend to keep your notes study those and then add on um, whatever the uh, uh, preparation kind of courses or more people you speak to so I'm going to, um, maybe it's an obvious question, but was it hard? Was it difficult to pass the AMC 1 and 2? So AMC part 1, uh, it was easier than the final clinical exam. Um, well, I found it easier. I think, uh, yeah, so I think, um, oh, it's just, it's the, the gravity of, of the of the barrier exam. You, you can't practice without it. So I think that's probably the biggest thing. Um, it's just you to really adopt some some core fundamental exam preparation stuff, which is, you know, don't leave the last minute, don't cram, um, set yourself up beforehand. So that's really important. And so for AMC part two, I'll just quickly embellish a bit more on that. There's, a, there's two ways to, to get through that exam. One is to sit a OSCE type examination, which has got a pass rate of about, I don't know, 20% or something. Um, or there's a uh, work-based assessment program, which goes over 12 months. And that's... Um, accredited uh, in various sites of hospitals and that's changing every year. Um, I was fortunate enough to do the work-based assessment, which has got a pass rate of in, in the 90s percent. 
Um, so it's certainly, uh, and look, those, those numbers are probably five years old. So ex excuse me if they're not up to date. Um, that was doable. It's, it was a fair exam, a work-based assessment. You have someone come in, assess you doing a clinical examination or a case-based discussion. It's a lot of work. Um, they, it's a bit expensive too. So it was, was $10,000 about five years ago. So I hate to think what it is now. Um, but it's a fair, a fair exam as opposed to the OSCE. But again, same thing, you know, OEM has good curriculum, save all your notes, um, you know, uh, so you can pull them out and revise them. You know, if you use, you know, flashcards, Anki cards, whatever your method is, uh, certainly keep them on standby for when you need it for the next hurdle. I'm going to pivot a minute because you mentioned your infant son and I did see this very cute picture of you at graduation. <laughs> that was posted by the National Institute of Integrative Medicine congratulating you. So I want to ask, what was that What was that like studying medicine and trying to get through rotations, having, a, having an infant at home? Because I know many of our um, prospective uh, students may have families as well and they may not may want to know what that's like. I, actually, we have a question from um, Manoj who has uh, two children and want, wants to know your advice in terms of enrolling at the uni. No worries. Obviously, you're talking about me being the cute aspect of the uh, the uh, the photo, not my son. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's tough, hey. So I decided to get to for us to fall pregnant and then have a baby uh, like six weeks before my final exam, which is a really poor decision. But uh, you know, you can't you can't control nature. Um, I think it's about you need to allocate study time. You need to block it. You need to be really rigid and organised. Um, you know, certainly, I think some of the ambassadors might have children uh, a bit older, which which would be another thing. But you need to set also family time. So you need to say Sunday afternoon, no study, spend with the family, and just gonna be rigid. You gotta get up early, go to bed late, and uh, sleep's optional. Um, of course, you need some sleep, otherwise you won't work. So it's just it's find that balance of how many hours minimum you need, and it just you need to have your your block away where the door is closed. You know. Mum and dad is studying, and when it when it's when it's family time, no textbooks, nothing of like that. And you also, if they're a bit older, you can get them reading some flashcards for you. You can start, you know, picking their aspects of their their anatomy on the on their and get them involved in your study and learning. Um, so and they're helping you. You are spending some time, but you're also getting something out of it. So it's a bit inventive. Be inventive. I do have a, another student who has her daughter read her medical textbook to her while they're driving to school. So I think you can be creative in terms of involving your children. So what, is, what does your son think of dad being a doctor now? Oh, he doesn't care. He just wants me home. <laughs> um, I think he'd prefer if I was a Garbo, in the, just home every day. Um, I mean, I've got the coolest job ever. Like, I'm in a role flying doctors, and he just doesn't care. Um, so, I think that's the thing. Uh, yeah. So, I think he he just wants dad. Uh, so, it's really hard to uh, to have that balance. So, I think it's again open discussion, um, involving your children in the decision making, or at least allow them to perceive they have a choice in decision when they will include in it, but they don't have a choice. Um, but if you feel make them feel lucky in the part of the team and helping you towards it, they'll have, get some gratification when you go to um, to graduation, holding up the diploma, the, the, their name should be on it too. So there's a question from C. Karen who asks, if you have a day job, how did you manage it? Which you clear, you did have a job during your preclinical. So how did you manage that time? I know that you had to have clear family time and clear study time, but if you were also um, working, how did you work that in? It's about picking an appropriate role, yeah. So I was a paramedic in mine, so I sat on my bum, and if I wasn't seeing patients, I was reading my textbook. So it's about utilising the time. Um, also worked as a, as a lifeguard um, on weekends at the local pool because um, we are just gearing up to not work for, for a while, for two years. So it's about strategising it, uh, so working with your mentors. Another thing with OUM is that you can do blocks, yeah, so uh, um, there's also minimum requirements to meet per year, but you might decide to go, you know, uh, two modules together and then have a time off a block where you're locum for, you know, so there's not always have to work. There's different ways to skin a cat. So that's why speaking to the uh, the faculty, your mentors, 
And if you need, but the one thing I didn't notice before, I didn't mention before, is that you need to talk about, talk about money. You need to talk about how you're going to afford to do what you need to do before you start. Um, so that's super important. Otherwise, you, I, I've had colleagues who are very, very intelligent and smart, but they ran out of money. Um, and that's the reality of it. So you could make sure you prepare for that too. So one other question um, about um, managing your studies. So Kim Barry wants to know, how did you manage your study? Did you have friends doing the exact same program whom you studied with and any form of ongoing support? I didn't have any friends. I had friends follow, and um, which is great, um, but no help to me. Um, I had a few study partners. Uh, one guy who was a bit of a jerk. Uh, he's using me, so he's about you know picking you, picking your groups. Um, I'm a bit of a passive chap, so yeah, I think it's going that self reflection. I think it's really important to going with, hey, am I achieving what I need to achieve? Am I you know spending enough time with the family? Um, am I earning enough money? Am I getting marks? It's really, you know, um, that internal review that's really important, bouncing off of your advisors. And that's, again, mental, so important. So Kimbari also asked um, about finding a job. Was it more difficult to find um, a job uh, having a, being an IMG versus an Australian graduate? Oh, so there's a few hoops, hey? Um, uh, we haven't got a guaranteed path, which is always unsettling, you know. Uh, but there's a few of us now who have graduated. Um, so there's a lot of pockets, more so in Queensland and, and uh, Tasmania, who, who know, I mean, that, that they know who, who, what, what our uni is about. Like you can, they don't go, oh, what's that? Is that even a uni? Um, they know who we are. We've, you know, we had about, you know, I think, 12 now down in Tassie, down in the northwest corner. Um, certainly up in the Sunshine Coast is known and with uh, Prof B uh, Bartholomew in the mix in the Brisbane sector. So it's a bit more known now. Um, it's just about many your minimum requirements for each state and that changes for years depending on the workforce. Certainly COVID's helped the workforce demand. So if you're graduating soon, I think that's probably not a bad thing um, because of the closing the borders and whatever else. Um, but I think it's about uh, being an open mind and it may not go to plan, so always have a plan B to it might protract in terms of time frame. So you won't just finish your degree and then get a job straight away. That there's a few hurdles to jump in between. So I think it's important to note that there are some additional steps, but not necessarily there's no like bias against someone just because their degree comes from a different place than where you're looking for a job. So there there is an opportunity for um, for New Zealand students to take the NZ Rex, for US or um, US bound practicing students to take the USMLE steps, and for Canadian students to take the MCCQE. So there's no kind of full barrier to practice. It's just kind of what you um, make of it, how you are, how you use your flexibility, and um, how you come to an understanding about how how and where you'd like to practice and how flexible you're going to be about that. And I think that's well, I just, I jump in quickly. For any, be any a, job, please go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I'll, I'll be a devil, devil's advocate. Um, it's there. There is there is a restriction. I think it's important to acknowledge that. Um, that you are not treated like a, a local graduate, um, but you offer more than a local graduate. Um, there are some places where you, you you will not get an internship, and that's okay. I don't want to go in there anyway. Um, but uh, but it's important. Uh, again, this is my perspective in going. Look at the look at the look at the negatives, and it, it's really important to acknowledge that. So there there are barriers. You are treated differently. You are an IMG, which means you have restrictions in in billing. You know, you got a ten-year uh, memorandum in your Medicare billing. That's okay. You can work through that, but you you have to know it, um, and you have to be realistic that there's some places. And Melbourne's very difficult um, to get your internship. Uh, New South Wales is very difficult. Uh, forever change. You know, Prof. Bartholomew is putting a massive work. You know, up to to Parliament. You know, like so. Is OEM's on your side, but it's tough. That's, uh, I just have to reinforce that because rose colour glasses is really easy to do it. Um, but you have to make sure you have to be realistic and um, it's worth it, but it, it can be tough. I think, I think it's important to note too that um, where you 
are doing your clinical rotations, like you're able to build connections. Um, in Canada, for example, there are dedicated uh, residency positions for IMGs. And with with COVID, as you mentioned, things are governments are trying to ease some of those restrictions. So I think it's important to know that um, going in, that your pathway will be different, and you may have some addition additional things that you have to do. But it's you are you can be fully capable of, of practicing. So important, I think, important to play both sides of devil's advocate there. So I want to talk um, a little bit about um, the um, interviews that you had for for internship positions. How, what was that like for you? How did you? Um, how were you able to get um, internship positions and and to um, move through those ranks? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's difficult for me because I'm a bit shy. Um, so sorry, I've been facetious, but uh, oh, we we interesting people. People who attend IUM aren't boring people so i think um that's a benefit you've got so much to talk about they're more interested about what you've done where you've been than uh than the official exam questions um so i think uh just the the by the the unique nature of our curriculum offers a, a lot of discussion points um so i think uh, yeah uh it's very dependent some people like interviews some people hate them uh certainly uh you know you can prepare like any other exam so what, um, what advice would you give to um, pers our prospective students that are here today about um, whether they should apply um, to start medical school? How would you advise them? Yeah, so I mean, you can do all your research and you can Google and um, you can do, do yourself crazy about getting all the information. I think that's important. Have a discussion with your family members, uh, close and, and all your support networks. And I think all the ducks align and you've you know, you've, you've got the ability to fund it. Um, I'm not sure why you should hesitate. Um, I think you just have a crack at it. And uh, knowing that uh, you've got some interesting years ahead of you. And for students who have just started the program, since we have some of those joining us today, so what would you, what would you advise students who are just at their very beginnings of their medical school journey? Stop Googling um, requirements for AMC. Stop Googling, are they going to ban OUM from practicing in Australia? Oh, I did it. So you have that uncertainty. Um, stop thinking about, I want to be a good doctor, so I need to study hard. Um, you can't be a doctor without your degree. So you need to be a good medical student first. Um, you need to be, you need to get your past exam in front of you. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how awesome you are at you know, putting a chest tube in someone, um, if you can't pass your, you know, your renal uh, module exam, you can't do your clinical. So I, I always say, is don't worry about being a good doctor. You need to be a good medical student first. I'm good. Uh, Abby would like to know, where was your internship? Yeah, so it's in the uh, Northwest Tasmania, uh, in a place called Burnie. And Ruan wants to know, um, did your overseas rotations in Nepal make your application for jobs stronger? So, uh, because of the increased exposure, I was noted when I was in theatre. Um, I had better technical skills than, than other, other interns. I had better practical skills. Um, and this makes it interesting. It's not, it's not necessary. I don't think you have to do it. Um, certainly if, if your family constraints don't allow you to do it, then you know, I wouldn't break, break your neck to get over there. But uh, again, it makes it more interesting. It makes you stand out. Uh, and I think that's all about it. There's so many good applicants meeting. You know, they've got AMC part one, maybe it's two, they've got this, that, you've got a degree that's recognized. Uh, what stands you out is the, the, the extracurricular stuff you do. Um, what you want to expand on that a little bit about the extracurriculars? Do you mean just like overseas rotations or are there other things? I think it's, and hence why I'm here, yeah, like it's about contributing to, to, to the greater picture, um, you know, supporting your university, uh, be proud. So I think the biggest thing is, um, is if someone asks you where you're studying, you, you say that with confidence and, 
and say, this is what I'm studying and I own it. Um, and people are like, oh yeah, cool. They'll ask about it, right? If you go, oh, you, you mumble and stuff, and they'll think, well, oh, not very confident with your studying. So, I mean, I, I was involved in, you know, advisor groups and um, workshops and uh, also the uh, student association. So I think it's important to give back. Be careful not to be too involved though. I mean, you need to spend, you know, you kind of overload yourself. I overload myself um, do all the time, but uh, I wouldn't recommend president? it. Were you president of the OUMSC? Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. So yeah, I was in, the, in, in, in a, yeah, I was in, in the founding group to, to do the bylaws and we had a lawyer ex-lawyer which really helped so we picked his brain so it was, it was a big deal we approached you know the um, American Student Association um, I, I was involved with them in terms of doing some scholar groups um, some global health and um, integrative medicine as well so certainly doing a bit of bits and bobs around um, certainly helps your application look a bit more inviting I think it's a good move for OUM going to the MD and the research I think that's certainly um, you know uh, a lot of Australian universities lagged with that. And I think research is, is, you know, the fundamental basis of, of um, evidence-based medicine. So I think having a sound knowledge in that is good. So I think that was a, a good move from OUM to doing that move. I would like to invite our student ambassadors to come on video for a moment if you like, or just um, turn mics on and I would like to invite you if you have any advice for prospective students who are thinking of applying to OUM. So I see um, uh, Jason and Thiba may be ready. So if one of you would like to go first. Yeah, sure, Dr. McGuire. I'll go. You can see me okay? I take it. Um, I think, I think from 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 my perspective, one of the important things about when I made my decision is to enrol as many people as possible into the conversation about starting university. Um, um, this medical degree for me is, I think, is my third or fourth degree, um, but it's the biggest challenge that I've set forth on uh, so far, as far as um, learning goes. So my 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 thoughts were to just enrol as many people as possible, um, making sure that all my friends and my family knew that I was studying medicine. Um, any questions that they had, I had to make sure for, for my own satisfaction and reassurance was that I could answer all those questions comfortably. But not only that, but it also helped me to stake my place in where I'm going to be for the next four, a good four years, so that I it helped to prepare myself as well as everyone else so that knowing that I was going to enrol and apply and optimistically get in, um, it kind of just set the stage. It, it allowed me to, to wipe the slate clean a little bit so that I had no pressures from anyone. Every, there was this common understanding that Jason's just started university again. He's going back and he's studying medicine and he's working full time and he's got a family. Let's just go easy on him for a while. So that was the, that was the, the plan and the strategy about enrolling as many people as possible. And so everyone knew what my intentions were. And that also helped to keep the ball rolling and, and it started to snowball the process. So rather than pull out because no one knew about it and it was easy to pull out of this dream goal of mine was to become a doctor. But instead, I just spoke to everybody. And I even think I remember speaking to Paris about it before I enrolled. In fact, I even remember Paris speaking to me when we were studying many, many years ago back at Victoria University, we did our undergraduates together. And he said, oh yeah, I'm gonna go back to study. And I'm like, oh, what are you studying? He's like, oh, medicine. Oh, where are you doing that? Oh, OUM. Oh, okay, tell me about that. So Paris did exactly the same thing. And so for me, it's all about getting it out there, getting the message out there and making sure that everyone was aligned with my goals. That was, that's the key take home message for me. Thanks, Dr. McGuire. Thanks, Jason, I really appreciate that. Uh, FIBA, would you like to take the mic? Certainly. Thank you, Dr. McGuire. Um, I hope every, everyone can hear me okay. Um, I was quite the opposite to Dr. Pierce and um, Jason. I actually, you know, kept it very low key um, because I'm, you know, I've got two children and I'm single parent, so I basically do not have time to talk <laughs> um, to, you know, work and study. So, 
I, I you know, to, to even now, it's just very low key to, you know, some of my close friends know. Um, but I just keep chugging along quietly. But, um, you, you know, I just try to, I guess my approach was like, I, I wanted to conserve that energy and put that towards my study and to get over the fence every time. And I do not have a healthcare background. I've got IT background. And this is this will be my third degree. So for me, it was really um, uh, putting in that extra hours to learn something that I wasn't quite familiar with. I started my med school journey with Macquarie Uni a few years ago. Um, having been in IT for so many years, I've had, you know, um, help, uh, medicine was like something that I wanted to do as a, 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 a kid growing up, but I didn't end up pursuing it because at that time it, it just seemed like too hard in terms of finances and um, all of that. So, um, you know, having worked in IT for quite some time, I was reflecting and I thought, oh, what next? How do I want my next 10, 15 years to be? You know, I've already got about 13 years of experience in this field and I'm kind of over it. And um, I did uh, one term of uh, health clinical sciences at Macquarie and I met one of the OUM students um, who was planning to start in OUM, but uh, was considering Macquarie and he told me about OUM and I was like oh I don't know I'm not sure you know I was like how Dr. Peace was saying googling and um, panicking uh, but anyway he enrolled and he did six months into it and he told me about the program and by that time I had already done one term at Macquarie and I did four courses and a full-time job it was intense it was crazy um, my work was nearby Macquarie so I, I even had to go to the labs during my um, breaks it was just really hard to keep up with that traditional um, curriculum style and so OUM really allowed me to have that flexibility and being able to realize that dream that I had finally so um, I took a post after that first term and I did well which helped me to um, with my e-foundations I must say um, I took a pause and like Dr. P said, you have to save up. You have to have money before you start this. So I've got, you know, IT project management experience. Um, so I've just kind of planned myself uh, financially, my time, everything uh, for the six months to, I think, almost a year while I was waiting to start with OUM. And by the time I started OUM, I, I just had to make sure that things were set up and in line because I had to pulled it through this by myself. Um, you know, I didn't have a, a second person to rely on. Decision-making wasn't too hard because it was just me who was deciding. So um, uh, it's been quite an interesting journey. And I'm um, in my second year, I'm doing mini cases uh, and SBMs, um, which is great because I don't have to rush to a university and try to find a parking, you know, spend one hour. I remember my exams in Macquarie, like, I'd be there an hour before my exam and I'd be driving around trying to find a parking um, and like running to my exam all sweaty and I would have forgotten half of the stuff that I learned. Whereas at OUM, I, I study, make sure I get plenty of sleeps before my, my actual exam. And on the morning I wake up, I revise, it's much more peaceful. Um, it, you know, I have more focus and I really love that, that style. Um, in terms of what, uh, you know, the future looks for me, I'm not worried. I'm happy and looking forward to those challenges. And um, uh, I know that OEM's got a really robust curriculum and I can see that through my SBM courses. Some of them are really intense and you really have to understand the style of, of your learning. Um, you have to adjust and recalibrate to every SBM you take. Uh, the, the instructor's style is slightly different. So you have to have a lot of self-reflection about uh, your learning style. Sometimes you have to adjust it. Um, so it's been a great journey. Um, good luck. And I hope uh, you stick to your decisions and it is doable. Um, just go for it. Good luck. Thanks. Thanks, Viva. Uh, Wheela, would you like to go next? Thank you very much, uh, Professor McQuire. Uh, thank you, Pierce, for all the uh, advices given. So I'm Wheela Lima from Samoa, and I um, um, come from a nursing background. And 
I think my background of nursing uh, gave me a very um, good uh, understanding of the basics uh, that helped me along with my medical degree. And um, I just want to advise everyone and all the prospective students that you have to be confident with yourself. And um, I think time management is very uh, important for you because you will be uh, reading a lot and studying a lot and there will be no social life for you, but you have to have your time management very uh, planned out uh, well. And you have to utilize all the resources uh, uh, that is available uh, within the OUM. Um, by saying that, you have to uh, ask questions uh, if you are in doubt uh, with your country deans, uh, course coordinators and uh, lecturers. Uh, ask your academic advisors because they have helped me um, uh, when, when I was in doubt and they put me back uh, on track. Uh, even the research advisors as well, um, they will be there to assist you with your research and advise you with everything. And um, yes, um, thank you very much. Thanks, Wheela. Elizabeth, would you like to add anything? Um, yes, I am, I'm from the US and I uh, came from a, well, I was a nurse first and then a nurse practitioner. I've been a nurse practitioner for 11 years. And I had always wanted to do medicine. Actually, I graduated from nursing school and went pre-med and then life happened. So, um, but it just kind of never left my spirit and my desire to go back to medical school. And I'd looked at different, a lot of different routes to make that happen in the U.S. And being a mid-level provider, um, there was just not a lot of viable options <laughs> without having to practically start all over. So this was why I picked OUM and I'm really been grateful that there's been something like that for people like me that have been practicing medicine for a long time and wanted to cross over, so to speak. Um, I agree with Uila that uh, you have to be ready to sacrifice a lot, um, a lot of friend time, family time. You're going to be moving. Things are going to be changing. It's a sacrifice things that you like to do um, to, but it's for a good cause. I mean, you know, it's like to get something good, you got to give up other things. So um, just go into that, you know, with all your relationships and, and you're going to lose friends and not be as close to people enough to get to do a lot of things that you used to do. But I mean, it's for something that you want to do. So make sure that you want to do it that much <laughs> um, before you um, before you get started. Um, and of course, you know, and then you find you meet awesome people along the way, too. You know, that's, that's, that's the beauty of it is that you meet a lot of great people and make a lot of new relationships. And, um, you know, you're learning all this beautiful things that get to save lives and change lives every single day. So uh, even knowing that I was previously practicing medicine and getting to do a lot of that, it's been great to take it to take even my practice now because I still have been practicing as a nurse practitioner to another level. And because um, I have more knowledge, I have more depth, I have more breadth um, and uh, didn't do it to become a doctor, get a doctor behind my name and for that reason, but so I could get, I could have more to give to my patients than I did before. So, um, but I, I think it's great. I highly recommend it. Highly, highly recommend it. Be hard, but most good things in life that are worth, worth anything are very, very hard. So best of luck. Thanks, Elizabeth. If you're interested in hearing more or speaking with some of our student ambassadors, I encourage you to reach out to your admissions advisor for further information about that. If you have some further admission related questions, you can always feel free to reach out to your friendly admissions advisor or join us for our admission session coming up in August and you can get the invitation from that from, you guessed it, your admissions advisor. I want to thank um, each and every one of you for joining us in our session tonight. I hope that you will take the advice uh, given and I hope to see you in one of my classrooms soon. Dr. Paris Pierce, I want to thank you so much for spending your time with us. I know you're very busy in multiple practices and with your family, we really appreciate your time, your attention, your honesty, and your candor this evening. So do you have any parting comments that you want to provide to our session before we close? 
Thanks. I really appreciate it. It's really nice to kind of um, touch base back with uh, with you guys. Um, it's just two things. Uh, make sure you own your decision. Um, be proud that you're studying medicine through AUM. Um, and just don't forget to be a good med student first. Don't worry about being a doctor until you've, you've done your degree. Thanks again. And thanks to all of you. We will see you all soon. Bye for now.